I'm very pleased to have Glenn Vogel here, who is head of mergers acquisition at Priceline. And Priceline is one of these companies which we kind of remember from the, from the 90s, which had this like, interesting business model of saying, I want to have a five-star hotel, and the hotels had to win the customer, and it seemed like hell, hell of a complicated process. But today, not a lot of people know, Priceline is actually the largest European internet company, and it's worth many, many, many billions. And we invited Glenn to talk us through how a Priceline kind of difficult, complicated business model became a 30 billion plus business through M&A. And we both have one thing in common, we like M&A. Yeah. And second, Glenn is also on stage to talk about what you're looking for in the future. So why don't you introduce yourself to start with and tell the audience what your job is at Priceline, please. All right, uh, thank you, Morgan. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my title, I have a lot of them. One is um, head of global strategy. I also run the M&A department, which is a department of one. Um, I also sit on the IT committee, which deals with all of our global IT issues. And I sit on the boards of all the companies that uh, we went out and bought. So it's a lot of different hats to wear. And I ended up with these. I started out just uh, to be a corporate development guy in 1999. Uh, when the true bubble was really roaring. It, you don't know what a bubble is if you haven't been in the markets in 1999. I was at Morgan Stanley and I, I wanted to be part of the great bubble and somehow I said, where can I go? And on the east coast of the US, there was only really one internet company to go to and that was Priceline, which had gone public uh, in 1999. And in just a couple of weeks, it had a uh, $30 billion market cap back then and uh, I started looking at it and I joined Priceline one week before the NASDAQ peaked. And from that point on, things uh, started deflating very rapidly. We only had one model, it was called name your own price. And the idea, as Mark was just describing, it was the idea a consumer could trade certainty for a large discount, which works out fine for something like an airline ticket in the US. And the example is if somebody lives in, say, Boston on the East Coast and wants to go to, say, San Diego on the West Coast, well, they're probably going to have to transfer anyway. It's going to take all day. So the idea was people would be willing to trade uncertainty in terms of when they were going to take off, what airline they would fly on, where the layover would be. In return, they'd get a great discount. And the airlines were able to get rid of excess inventory in a very opaque way so they didn't cannibalize their regular uh, channels. So that was the idea. And the, the idea was we're going to do this name your own price for everything. And that's why it had a $30 billion market cap. That was the idea. And I joined, and there were two strategies. One was take that name your own price idea and spread it into other, what we called verticals, or other ways to use that model. And the other thing was to just send it out internationally. And, and those are two of the dumbest ideas that, that I've ever been part of. And I'm kind of ashamed to say I even thought it could work at all. Because while the airline ticket is fine, the idea of name your own price for groceries is just an absurd thinking. I name your own price for beer, and you don't know what kind of beer you're going to get. Nobody was going to do that, and we wasted a tremendous amount of money on that one. The second idea, this name your own price for an airline ticket, well, it works well in the U.S. because the way the flight structure works there, it's hub and spoke. The idea that someone in London who wants to go to Paris and he can get an EasyJet or a Ryanair ticket for 20 quid is going to say, I'll save 10 quid, 50% off, and end up having to go to Istanbul first, that also was a crazy idea. Well, fortunately, there are European companies so Glenn told us a lot of things which didn't work back then. Right. And the market cap hasn't changed since 99, I understand. I think we are up 10%, 30 billion 99 when 30. Glenn joined, yeah. now 32 billion. Right. So Glenn created at least 2 billion of market cap. <laughs> if now, only it was the, that easy. The one thing which did change, however, is your EBITDA. Yeah. And, um, you know, internet companies grow up. And when you look at a 2 billion EBITDA, you, you clearly understand, oh my God, that's a large, large business. So did Europe save Priceline? Well, in fact, it did, because that 30 billion in 1999 became just 200 million in 2001 after the bubble burst. That's and when they issued you the stock options? Yeah, unfortunately, not as many as I would have liked. Um, we were bleeding cash like a pig that was cut off. It was horrible. And I, I was sent by the CEO. This, of course, 9-11 didn't help either, but even that was not the big problem. The big problem is the model didn't work in certain areas. 
and we are losing a tremendous amount in the international operations here in, the, in London. And my CEO said, Glenn, go to, go to London and stop this bleeding. And so I looked at it, and, and again, another stupid thing. This was a startup, and they'd started up in Mayfair. The idea of the startup, an office in Mayfair, a call center in Mayfair, it's just crazy stuff went on in those times. How much cash think. were you bleeding at Priceline at that point? Well, it depends on which operation, but it was millions, millions and millions every week for all the enterprises, um, so including you found, the So you found Booking, or Booking.com, with call center operations in inexpensive Mayfair. Yeah, well, what I actually did is, so I sent over to, to London, and I, I had to find who, who knows how to do this here, who knows how to run this business, and I found some people who had graduated from Cambridge, very smart guys, at a place called Active Hotels, and after a couple of years of trying to convince them that combining their regular way you buy an air, uh, a hotel where you actually know the price and you know what you're getting, and combining it with what we were doing, what we knew what to do, we thought it'd be a good combination. We spent $165 million in 2004 to buy them. They were very big in the UK. They didn't have a lot of operations outside of the UK, though. So that's when we said, well, we should find someone similar to them and find someone who does something well on the continent. And we found the guys in Amsterdam at a company called Booking.com. And we convinced them if they would join us and the three of us together could build something big, we paid $135 million for them. And that was 2005. So together with their model and what we were doing, that's where the real start of the takeoff cost. So $200 million mark cap in 2001, let's say, that's when things slowly began to build up. But even then, we were still tiny. I mean, Expedia at the time was so much bigger than us. And everybody talked about things like lastminute.com and e-bookers. Nobody knew who we were. Nobody cared who we were. People actually, um, people thought we'd gone bankrupt in the US, actually. You know, friends of mine who thought we had disappeared and would say, see, you leave Morgan Stanley. Look what happened to you. And it was, it was tough back then. So you have done an amazing deal and for the audience. So Booking.com, Active Hotels, Priceline, I mean, the main business model is to fill hotels. And users come through the great domain name, Booking.com. I think you're one of the largest Google spenders. You have a man, tremendous SEO. I think you have a, around 150,000 hotels. 265,000 or something. Because you bought Agoda in Asia, which gave you a big yeah. footprint there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, we, we did some math in, at NOAA, and we think that Priceline accounts for 50% of the online hotel bookings in Europe, which is around 6, 7 billion out of 12, 13 billion. These guys are huge. Yeah. Now, in terms of the next steps, uh, talking about M&A, and I guess it's a perfect example that M&A doesn't only work, but can change pretty much everything. Where is the trip going to? for Priceline. What, what is for you the next back, big thing? You're a bit like, if you look at it, like the Google in the hotel booking industry, you basically own it, you're very large, there's some other players, but you have so much power. You have big balance sheet. Glenn, what is, what is next for Priceline and what are you interested in? Well, you know, a couple of things about that. While we certainly are a major player in the online hotel space, we're still relatively small, actually very small, for the total hotel space. So we think there's still a tremendous amount of ramp there. Now, and how much is online? You say, so we said 12 billion, 13 billion in Europe is online today. I know you have a global perspective, but I'm unfortunately. Right. I, I'm not sure if your numbers I'd agree with, but we'll let those go. Um, you know, the, the business I I worldwide, and depending on which resource you want to look at, is hundreds of millions of dollars in the hotel space. Um, the point is that we were able to go beyond just doing what we were doing in the States going out, getting active, getting booking, doing this company called Agoda in Bangkok, three hotel-only online players. They comprise over 85% of the group's gross profit right now. So the U.S. is a relatively small part compared to the global uh, space, and the global areas where things are growing. Europe, Asia, South America, these are all growth opportunities for all the people who are doing hotel so business. So you are truly global online travel business. We have over 100 offices worldwide. We do, I don't know how many languages now, 40 something, I've lost count, 40 something different so, languages. So you have done a lot of things right. Tell us about your mistakes. Boy, I made a couple. I made, God, so many of them. Um, one, thing I'll, one thing that I did make a mistake, there's a company that I, that I always regret not having gotten, uh, which some of you people know, it's called Seamless Web. It's, an, it's like a takeaway, just eats, um, Is that a New York-based business? Hmm? 
for is it a New York based business? It is New York based for right. food delivery. Exactly. That's 2005, and I thought, well, gee, everybody who travels needs to needs to eat, and here's a proposal combination, and we came very very close to doing that deal. And the reason we didn't was the projections they gave us. Um, did not match up with the performance in that last month when we were getting ready to you know, close the deal. And we asked the founder, we said, gee, why don't we just wait a month or two and just see if things start coming back. And he had a, a, another offer out there and he went for it. And I've always regretted that. I think about that many times when I look at transactions sometimes is don't necessarily let just one little hiccup blow an entire deal. On the other hand though, most of the times that is what I see. I go out, I look at companies, almost every time I get a projection, it has the usual flat, 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 and then the miracle happens and everything is going to go like this six months after we close. None of that ever happens. I, I, I have a lot of sympathy what you are talking about. In M&A, just under promise and over deliver, it's probably the best formula to, to make well, a deal happen. Right, and that's what happened with Booking. Booking was the only company, and I was an M&A banker for a long time. Um, I, I'd never seen it. Booking, they kept on overperforming. We talked to them for a long, long time. That sucks. And they, they just, just really didn't make the numbers. They just doubled them. Yeah, exactly. Dreadful. <laughs> well, can you say the analysts project like 2 billion ABITDA for this year? Yeah. Um, how much is coming from Europe? Is that a, a number you, you can disclose? Well, I, I, I won't. We don't actually break out geographic, but what I can say is we do say that 85, 86 percent of our gross profit, now some of the analysts will say we have a higher margin outside the U.S., so you can do the math. You um, can easily say most of the profit comes from outside the U.S. And it's a problem, though, when you get $2 billion or whatever the analysts are saying, in terms of how do, you, how do you continue to maintain this growth. We did our earnings release last Thursday, and uh, you know, we had uh, growth at 20-something percent of EBITDA growth. And I start looking at M&A deals, and for it to matter, to matter, the question is, well, will this do anything for the needle or will it move the needle Is, is or that not? a problem for you that you need to find large businesses to buy in order to move well, the famous needle? you know, I think that is one of the things. We certainly are looking at larger deals, but the other thing we're all thinking is don't let that stop us from doing smaller deals, mm. too, that could down the road grow to do things. We started a thing in the spring called Priceline Ventures, which is typical corporate VC type work. We're willing to go down to is... Um, so I'm you have a corporate VC we yeah. invest from the balance sheet. Exactly, is, is from the balance sheet. We have almost what, $4.6 billion that, you know, cash just sitting around. Uh, it's not even earning zero interest. In some places, we have to pay money to the German government actually to put our money there. So we're looking for all opportunities. So we'll go as far as down as $250,000 for some we're looking and at. And are, these are, you're looking for opportunities which are kind of related to the travel leisure sector? It doesn't have to be. It's nice if it is, but it doesn't have to be at all. For example, if we were to find someone who really understood, let's say, the social space and had nothing to do with travel at all, but we thought we could learn something from those people, we'd want to do a deal with them. And the thing that we bring to the table, unlike many of the standard financial VCs, is that we built three, now four, including Travel Jigsaw, which the company bought two years ago, we built four businesses from very, very small numbers to extremely large numbers. So we have some expertise that we would say, we'll share this with you. We'll share this knowledge. We'll help you get to that higher scale level. Right. In return, what we do is maybe we learn something about social, maybe we learn something about mobile, things that we don't know, but it wouldn't hurt for them to help us learn those things. So are you worried about Google? I know you're a big spender on them, but Google seems to be very interested in the travel space with the acquisition of ITA, launch of Hotel Finder. Um, we haven't seen at Google huge revenues coming from non-search products, but you're kind of a search business yourself, executing the search, of course, and getting a booking fee. But tell us, are you worried about Google? You know, I, I worry about everybody, actually. You know, it's uh, uh, Andy Grove at Intel wrote that book called Only the Paranoid Survive, and I, I think there's a lot of meaning in that. Uh, Google is huge, enormous, and, and there was an article last week in the New York Times uh, newspaper about a company called Nextag, and it all talked about how their business was greatly hurt by a change in Google's algorithms. It, it, listen, is that a recent thing? Or? Less, less, well, the, no, the algorithm change was uh, two years ago or so, but I'm it's done. the effect of what it did to Nextag. And this can happen to anybody who, who actually depends on Google for customers. Obviously, we have some good brands, it's, uh, and we, we, we believe that no matter what, we'll be successful. That being said, though, we worry about all the big players, and it's not just Google. Let's talk about new players. I mean, Trivago, for example, is presenting on stage. They are a big aggregator of different OTAs. Mm -hmm. um, then there are the Airbnbs of the world who are trying to 
redefine travel one fine stay today we saw also yeah. um, is do you think this is helpful for the overall online travel industry or are you worried about competition well again I worry about competition but it is I think it's always helpful to have new ways to do business and uh, hopefully we'll be able to adapt look the business will always change all our businesses are always changing I've been now Priceline 13 years so I've seen so many different things come and go a company like Airbnb is interesting. It's very interesting in the sense that here's a group of people who are willing to try something entirely new, even though in some of their major markets, their business is illegal. I mean, in Paris and in New York, there are laws that prevent you from doing some of the transient type uh, renting that goes on there. Um, the tax rules are just kind of ignored by a lot of people, but they were willing to take that you know, leap forward and say, hey, we'll figure it out down the road. Uh, Uber, another example of a company that's run into some regulatory issues, but again, it's people who are breaking the bounds or getting on the edge of the envelope, however you want to say it, who are coming up with these great new ideas, new things. Well, what we learned today, I guess, was passion is everything. So if you have passion, regulatory boundaries don't matter too much. Another thing we learned today is that most of the people sitting on these wide chairs carry an iPhone. What smartphone do you have, Glenn? I do have an iPhone right now. Another iPhone. I okay. Do. We have a lot of, but we build apps for Android. We build the apps for, you know, others too. Another iPhone. Okay. Well, Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored that you came here, and we wish you to find the next Booking.com or Active Hotels at our conference. Thank you.